I'm going to do better. Yeah. Romans chapter 10, verse 5, and it reads like this. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the, of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? Verse 8. The word is near you. In your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon his name. Verse 13. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You all may be seated. Father in heaven, in Jesus' name, as we go into this new sermon series, entitled Becoming a Better Believer. Help us to understand that believing is more than just words. So I pray right now that you allow our belief system to allow it to change and transform our lifestyle to the end that when you see us, you see the fruit of the Spirit. We thank you, we bless you, and we love you. Now we pray that you allow the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart to be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name, we all say amen. amen. Becoming a better believer. Part one of our sermon series, for those who are taking notes, I'm going to take my time, amen. is a better relationship. Thank you, God. A better relationship. Family, no matter where you live, what you do, there's one thing you all have in common, is that you will go through life establishing relationships. I know many of you all say, well, Pastor, I don't have good relationships. And just because they're not good doesn't mean it's not a relationship. Some of us were raised in environments where we weren't taught how to conduct ourselves in relationships. Truth be told, some of the older generations, I found out that some of y'all parents never even told you I love you or kissed you. Unless something happened where you got scolded, that was the only time you got undivided attention. But how many people know that just because you were raised in that environment doesn't mean it was right? There are some relationships that are toxic. And they are so toxic that you've been living with them so long that now that you finally get something healthy, you look at it strange. You're so used to being told what you're not then now somebody tell you what you are, you think they got an ulterior motive. Yeah. And now because you have a hard time having relationship with people, it is now flowed over into your spiritual relationship with God. Can I preach? In relationships, you realize that there are three things that every relationship needs. Say three things. The first thing that every relationship needs is communication. You can't be in a relationship and not know how to express yourself. 
Communication is important because um, growing up, some relationships were toxic because you were told as a child that you ought to be seen and not heard. And not heard. But, but my, my, my question with that is, if you can see me, I have a mouth, I can talk, why you don't want to listen to me? And then you get mad when you want to come and talk to me, and I don't have nothing to say. So now you see how communication is important in your personal life. Why? Why? Because personally, in order to build with anybody, you got to be able to talk to somebody. Nobody wants to be in a relationship with somebody that don't talk. Fellas, women, they are emotional creatures. Emotional creatures like to talk. Amen, somebody? So, fellas, we must be relational and have what I would call emotional intelligence. To be able to listen, receive, and respond to what's being communicated to us. Jesus. So, so if you're not able to do that, your relationships will suffer. Some of us don't know how to do it because we weren't taught, we were told. Let me get back to that. So, so we identify that I gotta work on my communication skills. In the older generation, sometimes when they were mad at you, when you did something wrong, they didn't talk to you. They reprimanded you. They chastised you. They whooped you, but never told you why they whooped you. So now you're trying to figure out how not to do it again. But you never explained to me what I did the first time. And then you had a nerve to hit me and then say, shut up before I give you something. Can I preach? That's toxicity at its finest. Now you done whooped me now. <laughs> now I got PTSD. So now if you don't know how to communicate, you're going to have a hard time articulating your emotions. Because whether you know how to communicate or not, you know how to communicate or not. What you say, say something. And what you don't say, also say something. So in communication, well, how does this affect my spiritual life? Some people have bad relationships with their earthly father. And now they have a hard time hanging out with the heavenly father. Because the earthly father is the first example of what a relationship looks like with a father. So you're telling me I have a hard time hanging out with the one that I see. And now you're telling me to trust in, believe in, follow Somebody that I don't see. So now as a Christian, communication is simply prayer. Somebody say prayer. Prayer Prayer is simply talking to God. And if you want to have a better relationship with God as a believer, you got to know how to talk to God. And communication, nobody wants to only communicate when things are going good. The best communication is when things go right. And I believe that the reason our, my marriage is strong is because we do a whole lot of communicating. I thought her being a truck driver was the worst thing to happen. I ain't gonna never see my wife. My baby left me. But with her job and my job, we talk for hours, literally. So now you identify where there's no communication, that can't be my second component. Number two is no trust. Can I preach? So you want to, because you can't trust what you don't understand. And I don't understand if you don't tell me. So if I don't, if you don't tell me, I don't know. Ladies, men are not mind readers. And you could, you could think we're a mind reader, but you could tell us. Show us. And we still ain't gonna know. And we gonna still say what you say. Can I get an amen, fella? So I think it's very unfair. Extremely unfair. Testify, sir. To expect me to read your mind when I can't remember when you said it. 
trust, 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 trust is important. Why, why? It has to be a part of the foundation of any healthy relationship. You can't have a healthy relationship with insecurity. Because what happens is insecurity normally kicks in when confidence shows up. Because a person that's insecure will see confidence as cockiness. And a person that's insecure, they'll like to make you feel small to make them feel big. Come on, preach. Come on. Relationships. I want to trust. I want to make sure that I trust that what I what you say is true. Why? Because in this season, you gotta learn how to evaluate all relationships. Say relationships. Relationships. Why? Because if a relationship is unhealthy, how can you trust it? Y'all buying cars, we getting new cars, and I tell everybody, I got a brand new Tesla for y'all. Right now, you get a car, you get a car, you get a car. But, none of them have been test driven. Look, she's out with them no more. I was gonna get that. Ah. Thank you though, but it's the, it's the thought that counts. Why? Because you can't trust what's never been tested. Hey, hey, come on. So you can't say you got a good marriage if you ain't never been through nothing. Well, come on. Well, well. You can't say that y'all are tight like that until something happens where you find out how tight you really are. And you can't build on something that you can't trust. So sometimes in order to trust it, you gotta work on communicating to get a better understanding. And the reason some of y'all can't trust God is because you have not spent time learning about it. Because in, in a relationship, how, how am I going, how do I expect you to delight in me when you don't even know me? Yeah. I can't expect you to trust God when you don't know him. You don't understand his principles, his precepts, or his ways. So how can you put your trust in a God that you don't see if you don't spend time getting to know him? Yeah. Last but not least, you want to make sure that you got respect. Somebody say respect. respect. Those are three components that every relationship must have. You got to have some communication, you got to have some trust, and you got to have some respect. There's so many more that things that you do need, but I promise you, if you get those, those three things right, it'll make your marriage a whole lot stronger. It'll make your relationship a whole lot stronger. It'll make your life a whole lot stronger. Why? Because you don't want to only focus on the relationship with God. Let's talk about the relationship with you. I know y'all was thinking about everybody else. You were pointing at the everybody, lottie, dottie, and everybody. But my question is, have, do you communicate with you? Do you trust you? Do you respect you? The relationship with yourself is the one that many people overlook. I know that I'm right because you treat other people better Then you treat yourself. So, so, so here today in our text, I'm gonna go ahead and get to the text because y'all ain't liking me no more now. Is that we see it was written by Paul. Paul was writing to the church in Roman, letting them know that they needed to get some stuff in order. He was teaching them about the past and the future. They were in the place where they were still dealing with the law. He understood that he was very well versed, he could speak several languages, but he made sure he broke down salvation so simple. Rome was a cool place, but it was also a rough, ratchet, and ungodly place. The Jews have established customs and traditions, and they were additions according to God's law. They tried to become righteous by doing everything right. The only way we could be righteous is by doing everything right as if we were perfect and we've never sinned. Yeah. I'm not talking about you doing your best. I'm talking about not one single sin. I know somebody thinking in the back, but well, why did God give them rules in the Old Testament if he knew we would break them? Galatians chapter 3 verse 9 answers your question, Miss Angie. Verse 19 says, what purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions. Till the seed, Jesus, 
till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. God used the law to set the stage for Jesus. Pay attention, pay attention. They would take animals and they would sacrifice the lambs. They would sacrifice them. But Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. So we see here that God met the qualification. Jesus met the qualifications to pay the ultimate penalty for sin. So each year on the Day of Atonement, they would give a temporary solution for a permanent problem. But Jesus said, okay, that's the Old Testament. Somebody say Old Testament. Old Testament. That word Old Testament is simply when you get to see that it's God's will. That, old, that word testament, it's another word for covenant. Somebody say covenant. covenant. So you have Old Covenant and you have a New Covenant. So the, they were struggling because they were trying to live under the New Covenant while still trying to appease the law of the Old Covenant. So now they were confused. So Paul was letting them know, he says, listen, I need y'all to understand that you don't have to keep giving sacrifice no more. Because you keep thinking, you do me a favor by killing an animal. No, I'm going to kill my son, the Lamb of God, and he's going to be the ultimate sacrifice. So now I don't desire burnt offerings no more. Don't do that. He says, what I do desire is a living offering. What do you mean? It's an offering, a sacrifice. He says, offer yourself up as a living sacrifice. Then he tells you expectation, holy and acceptable. So don't just offer me any old thing. But work on yourself. Because I'm going to give you the tools that you need to get yourself together. Why? Because I need to make sure that we have a healthy relationship. So, so, so now it says in uh, verse 11, it says that every priest must stand, every priest standing, ministering daily and the offerings repeatedly and the same sacrifice, which can never take away sin. But this man, after he had offered his own one sacrifice for sins forever, he sat down at the right hand of God and from that time waited until his enemies are made his footstool for by one offering he has a perfect and forever who those who are being sanctified. Somebody say sanctified. sanctified. Verse 15 but the Holy Spirit also witnessed to us for after he had said before this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saying, the Lord, I will put my law into their hearts and into their minds, and I will write them. Then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. Now, where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. What that mean, Pastor? Jesus came to offer his body on the cross for us as a sacrifice completely acceptable to God, which gives us good news. And by living like this, we are now pleased by God's sacrifice through Jesus. So now that we accept his full sacrifice, that's how we receive, somebody say salvation. Salvation. So now we see there's three things we're going to see. Number one, say the confession of our faith. He says... Confess with your mouth. Confess with your mouth. So you're telling me what I say is very, very critical. Why? Why? Because my words, life and death, lies in the power of the tongue. And verse 8 says, the word is near you. In your mouth and in your heart. So where does the word of faith go? It goes in your heart. That's why it says confess with your mouth, but believe in your heart. And some of us have a hard time having a healthy relationship with God because we have not healed our hearts. Come on. Wow. So now it, it, it's, it's damaged. Why? Now it's been things that happen to your heart. So now it's hard to trust again. It's, it's hard to, to love unconditionally because the last time you had love, it came with conditions. It's hard to forgive when every time you say you're sorry that they bring it right back up and hold it over your head again. It's hard to move forward 
When it seems like every time you take one step forward, you get knocked ten steps back. So now you identify the confession of your faith. So, so Matthews 10, 32 says, whoever acknowledge me before others, Come on. I will also acknowledge him before my father in heaven. Yeah. So what are you confessing? Yeah. So in, in confessing, you out of, out of, in order to understand confession, you must also understand sin. Confession is simply saying I did. And anybody in a relationship knows that woman, when a woman asks you a question, Alrighty. they already know the answer to it. Every time. It's a universal law. It's a setup, fellas. It's a setup. And, and the way they operate is, they're not going to ask you right there today. They're going to wait 274 days later and ask you, hey, remember January the 12th? 2014. <laughs> At 2:45. <245. laughs> At 2:45, you have the blue polo shirt, some green jeans, and a white hat. <laughs> and they don't ask you a question because they simply want to know what's your confession. <laughs> so, so some of the times, the truth is, all they really looking for is a confession. They they gonna get a lie probably, but they looking for the confession. <laughs> They might get the lie. <laughs> but, 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 but some problems, all they had to do was admit it. Because the truth is, you already kind of forgave them a little bit. A little bit. A little bit. Not a whole lot of bit. We ain't gonna lie in church. Just a little bit. But if they were honest, somebody say honest, honest. and took responsibility and said they did it, you would have been more acceptable because they were, somebody say, accountable. accountable. Because that's what it is, what it is. And confession is simply being accountable. Yes. And, but, but confession doesn't make it go away. Confession simply says, I did it. Now I'm not gonna do it no more. That's it, that's it. That's it, that don't mean you're gonna do it again. It don't mean I ain't gonna do it no more. It's like, I did it. Well, I did it, that's, but, that's, but leave, look, some people don't even wanna do that. They still in denial. So how you gonna stop doing what you ain't never accepted you are doing? So you identify that I gotta be confession, which means I gotta take accountability, I gotta be responsible. Why? Because Usher ain't the only one with confessions. And some of us ain't here today. I need y'all some good news, I needed that. <laughs> you notice when you go, why certain show the Catholics, they go into a box yeah. called confessional. Yeah. And they go and they talk yeah. to another brother yeah. who is just as flawed yeah. as me. Yeah. And all they doing is listening. Yeah. It hustling. And they're confessing to someone who does not have the power to forgive sin. There was three preachers. They went on a retreat. And they said, all right, what are we going to do here? They said, this is where we're going to go as preachers. We're going to relax. And we're going to let our head down. We're going to get comfortable. Because, you know, as a preacher, we always got to keep ourselves stand up. We got to be on point. We got to be mindful. So we're going to open this up to share. Do anybody have any confessions to make? One priest says, you know what? I'm going to confess. I got a gambling problem. I play the lottery. I, 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 be at the, I play the horseshoe. I bet the horseshoe. I'll be at the live. I go to Dover, Delaware. I got to be at the horse track. I'll be up at uh, Park Heights, Pimlico. I ain't be sports betting now. I got problems, right? I got problems. I got right here on my phone right now. He said, oh, you got a problem? He says, oh. The other one said, oh, you? We got children to church, right? Hallelujah. The other one says, man, I can't stop watching those, 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 those movies. <laughs> those movies. <laughs> I can't help myself. They just keep calling me. I've been trying to watch something else, but I always find myself hitting that button. I just can't stop. And he says, oh. One preacher, third preacher, lean back in his chair and says, my God, you 
like gambling. And you be watching all kinds of stuff. <laughs> Amen, somebody. Amen. He said, well, let me tell y'all my confession. Mine is gossiping. And I can't wait to get back to church. Because I'm going to tell everybody about you watching them movies and you gambling. I say all that to say, you got to be careful who you confess your sins to. The Bible says, confess your sins one to another. So that you may be healed, so you can't keep confessing to people that's hurting you. Can I use my brother for example? We've been rolling for a long time. And it's a strong time. And we, we talk, we confess. We don't sit there and sugarcoat nothing. And we don't hide. And, and I don't put my preacher hat on. And I don't act like I got it all together. And I ain't never make no mistakes. So guess why? We can confess. Why? Because it's a, com it's a, it's a comfortable space. Because we can confide. Yeah. Yeah. Stop confessing to people who want to see you. Who want to keep uncovering you. Right, because confession is, the purpose of confession is not to uncover you. The purpose of confession is for correction. And, and it takes a strong person to be mature enough to acknowledge where they're falling short. Come on, come on, come on. But you can never be forgiven for a sin you never confess. Come on, sir, come on, sir, come on. The Bible says. Get us Bible. Come on with that Bible, y'all. I'm not going to lie. The Bible says, Come on with that Bible. 1 John chapter 1 and 9. If you confess your sins, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But if you don't confess your sins, how can he forgive you? And how can he clean you? Come on, come on, come on. God won't take you out of what you never acknowledge that you're in. Come on, come on. So upon the confession of your faith, I got to say I need help. I'm an addiction counselor. Y'all know that, right? Yes. First thing I do, first time I meet you, out of the first statement out of your mouth, I know if you're going to make it or not. Because if the first thing you start doing is talking about everything but what you're doing, you ain't ready yet. So you got to take accountability because then you say, well, my family this and my this and my that. No, no, no. You have a choice. Somebody say choice. Choice. Somebody say free will. Free will. And, and that's what Paul was teaching them. He says, y'all got choice and y'all got free will. But you got to make sure that if you're confessing it with your mouth and believing in your heart, it should match in your feet. Yes, sir. Yeah. It should match in your feet. Wow. Come on, sir. It should match in your feet. Right? Because, because the, he says, if you live in it, if you say you live in it, you should see the fruit. Amen. Right? Because a lot of them were living the law. They were doing it for the look. But he was letting know, it's not about a look, it's a lifestyle. Yes. It's not a look, it's a lifestyle. Because he said they had the form of godliness. Come on. But denying its power. So it lets us know that you got to be mindful of what you confess. Because if you say Jesus is Lord, it should change your lifestyle. Yeah. Not just as Savior. Everybody gets to know him as Savior, but not everybody makes him the Lord. Amen. 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 Because Savior means save me. Get me out of trouble. But Lord means I'm going to give you my life to live for. Now my hands is yours. My mind is yours. My heart is yours. All, all I had belonged to you. Philippians 2 and 11 says, And every tongue that acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God, the Father. So we got to be mindful that when we say he's Lord, we have to make him Lord. Because if you say you make him Lord, it should be some fruit. Why? Because they, let me give y'all some, some words. Come on, somebody. Write down salvation. salvation. Right, write that down. Yeah. Write it down, salvation. Write down consecration. consecration. And I'm going to give them to you on Thursday in Bible study. We can give some vocabulary words. Put sanctification. And last but not least, justification. Just, yes, amen. Come on, read it back to me. Come on. Salvation. Salvation. Consecration. Consecration. 
sanctification. Justification. Y'all got it? So when you, and let me give y'all one more. Conversion. Study these words. Look them up. Because on Bible study, I'm going to make sure we're going to go over and we're going to break them down so you can get an understanding. Because these are keys to a good relationship. Because if you have learned the Bible wrong, you're going to live the Bible wrong. Yeah. Come on, sir. Come on, sir. Because they were learning the laws, but not understanding that it wasn't the law that could save them. Jesus fulfilled the law. So now they're trying to figure out all of these things that I'm doing is going to make me saved. He says, no, it's nothing you can do to earn salvation. That's right. That's right. That's right. You just got to receive it. That's right. So now, number one, your confession of your faith. Number two, conversion of the heart. Because a lot of times we can do confession with our mouth, but there's no conversion in the heart. How do you know the difference, Pastor? Confession is saying I did it. Repentance which means turning. That's the Greek word for metanoma, which means you must turn from it. That's why you hear, you hear the old saints say, yep. Come on, Patty. I'm going to go ahead. I'm on my way. On, they would say things that were sounding good, but were scripturally unsound. Say it. Tell us. Teach us. <laughs> Let me get my testimony. <laughs> God came and saved me. Love. Pick me up. Love. Turn me around. Play my Pause. If he picks you up <laughs> and he turns you around, you're in the same spot where you started. God, 360 my life. That's why I look like That's why you recognize that. You need God to win the 80 in your life. I can see the 360. That's why you're still the same. The fruit's still bad. Yeah. That's, that's what makes sense. I knew it was something. It's the 360 that got you messed up. But repentance is 180, which means I'm turning from something to someone. Come on, come on. Amen. So you identify that I can't confess with my mouth, but never change in my heart. Because conversion doesn't happen in the mouth. Mm -hmm. It happens in your heart. Yes. Yes. And when you're truly converted as a Christian, it starts in your heart. That's why you got to be mindful of what you say out your mouth, because what's happening in your heart. Yes. Many times what you say out of your mouth is a clear indication there's something wrong with your heart. Yes. I ain't forgiving them. Heart messed up. They yes. wish I would. Your heart is a heart posture. Because if you understand that you have been forgiven for a lot, you can forgive for a lot. Yes. And you think I let them go because they need to be let go? No, I let them go because he let me go. Because the truth of the matter is, if it had not a bit for the Lord on my side. Come on, sir. Come on, sir. Come back in the hop. Sit down, y'all make me nervous for the village. <laughs> Security. <laughs> Conversion of the heart. So, so you have to ask God, God, convert my heart. The purpose of a converter, it takes something and converts it into something else. It could take air and turn it into gas. So it converts something. It changes it from one form to another form. So the reason you may not be able to, to, to give forgiveness is because you have not learned to receive forgiveness. That's why we say the scriptures and we get it wrong and we love to say it as uh, uh, press down, shaking it together, and running over. Shall men give unto my bosom? Go back a verse. He's not talking about money. Judge not, lest you be judged. He's talking about mercy. He's saying that if you give a little bit of mercy, you'll get a lot of bit of mercy. So check your measure of mercy. Yes, yes. So he says, conversion of the heart. Ezekiel 36, 26 says, and I will give you a new heart. A new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone 
from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. That heart of stone, that's that cold heart. And, and then nothing can get in, nothing can get out. And that stony heart, it normally starts as a child. Yes, yes, yes. And, and, that, and it starts off cold, but it turns into ice cold. Then it turns to, to stone cold, and then what happens? It just, nothing can penetrate it. Not at all. Come on, sir. And then when you finally let something hit it, and, and, and anything you know that's frozen, and you take a piece of ice and you drop it, it shatters. So then you go from a cold heart to a broken heart. Wow, Jesus. Come on, and, and what is in your heart? The seat of your emotions. That's where your feelings, your mind, your world, your intellect is. And that's where your salvation, your foundation of your foundation is because that's where your belief system is set up. And a lot of our belief system has been messed up so now we can't even see God how God needs to be seen because somebody done messed up our heart. So stop asking God to fix your heart and tell him to give you a new one. Because you're doing patchwork. I don't want to do patchwork because patchwork is a temporary fix. I need to hurry up and keep going. Some of our heart need to be, we need to get some heart surgery. We need to sit on down somewhere. We need to go to the pre-op. I mean, let you know what you need to work on. You can't eat, you can't do this, you can't do that. This is messed up, this messed up, and then you get surgery. And then after you go through surgery, then you gotta go through recovery. And so, so stop taking that broken heart, trying to get everybody else to fix it. Because now you realize that if I'm doing bad in one relationship, I'm probably struggling in more than one. So I gotta start with the relationship with me. Say me. How do I treat me? If I treat me bad, I'm telling everybody else how I want to be treated. You think you treating other people good, that's not telling them that. That's just saying you good person. How do you treat you? Because if you treat me better than you treat you, I'm not going to treat you better than you treat you. All right, ouch, come on. But when you show me how you treat you, it sets a boundary. Say boundary. Boundary. Or what's expected. A lot of people don't get it because you don't expect it. Right. So now you find it out you have a lot of unhealthy relationships. How you know it's unhealthy? We can't even have a disagreement without cussing and fussing. And it's something that you gotta work on in your heart. It's a hard thing. Why do you get defensive when somebody told you you was wrong? You were wrong. Eat it. Own it. Confess. You right. You are right. I am sorry. I'm gonna work on it. Because nobody wants to build a relationship with somebody who don't do no wrong. There's nothing more discouraging in a marriage when you go to tell your spouse after you done finally mustered up the energy, prepare the conversation to go and say, hey, I want to talk. We want to talk about, hey, I want to talk about um, something going on in our marriage. What's going on? Yeah, I'm... Um, I don't feel like you're showing me enough attention. What you mean I ain't showing you? <laughs> you already missed it. You already missed it. Ah, you ain't, I've been cooking and cleaning and you, you missing it. Cause I come home and I work 12 hours and you're missing it. And I make sure you got food every day, you're missing it. You gotta open up your heart to hear with more than your ears. Because it takes a strong person to open up their heart and share. So when they open up, learn how to open up your ears and receive what they're saying. And after you listen, then respond. Conversion of the heart, conversion of the heart. Acts 3.19, it says, repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out. Now we're talking about the sin thing again. That, now that's what affects your relationship with God. It separates us. 
It draws space. But he's saying, you don't have to keep that space there. Confess with your mouth, believe in your heart. What do that mean? It says, repent, say, God, I'm sorry, and come on back. Yes. He's not saying you got to stay out there. He says, but you got to be honest enough to repent. Yeah. You can't say you repent and stay there. But then he goes, and what I love about God is this. He says, after you confess and repent, he'll forgive you and he'll remember them no more. Yes. So why? Uh, so why? People be saying, Christians, let me go to Christians. I can't worry about people. Christians be saying, I can forgive. I can't forgive. I wouldn't forget either. I keep reminding myself every time something happens. You keep trying to remember what you trying to forget. <laughs> Make that make sense. But you may not forget what happened, right? But, but you can forget the consequences. Why? Because mercy says, listen, that should have happened. That would have happened. And it could have happened. But because of me, it didn't happen. So, and, and, and forgiveness, you got to be willing to let it all the way go. Yes. Because many times, we say we forgive with our mouth. Yes. But we hold the grudge in our heart. Yes. Psalm 51 says, create in me a clean heart. And renew a right spirit within me. So, you're telling me that there's some things on the outside of you that will be impacted because you have not done any work on the inside of you. The work starts with that. Last point, we almost done. Say commitment to Christ. Commitment, commitment to Christ. What do you mean commitment to Christ? That word commitment is a tricky word. That word commitment is not based off of convenience. Commitment means the state or quality of being dedicated to a cause. An engagement or obligation, which means that if you committed to it, you're going to do it. Yes. Marriage is not about convenience. It's about commitment. Yes. You think we always get along? You think we always the best of friends? You think it's, no, it's not true. <laughs> but we committed. That's the difference because commitment is not based off of convenience and some people only want to serve Christ when it's convenient for them. How do you know the difference? Convenience is just Savior. Commitment is Lord. So I don't want to just, I don't want him just to save me. I want to live for him after he saved me. So in doing that, you got to say, am I committed to Christ? Commitment changes your life. That's right. That's right. So when you identify, I'm committed, there's something, when I'm committed in my marriage, there's some things that I just don't do because I'm a married man. That's right. That's right. Fellas, I'm not coming out. I'm not hanging out all night long. That's right. That's I'm not. That's right. Because when I get cold at night, y'all ain't going to keep me warm. Amen? <laughs> and if you want to do I wouldn't want you to anyway. Hallelujah. That's right. I'm going to want my wife. That's right. That's right. So, so I identify that it's not about what I feel, it's not about what I want, it's about who I'm committed to. And when you are committed to Christ, you understand that I'm not going to be committed when things are convenient. I'm going to trust Him when things get hard. I'm going to trust Him when things get difficult. When even when I don't see it, I'm going to keep praying for it. Even when I don't see it, I'm going to keep believing. Even when I don't see it, I'm going to keep on trusting. Why? Because the Bible says, be not weary in your well doing. For a due season, you shall reap if you faint not. Is there anybody here that made up your mind that I'm going to keep on pushing, I'm going to keep on pressing, and I will not faint not? Why? Because I made up my mind that I'm going to trust in Jesus. And the old hymn writer said it like this. It's so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word. So, so a commitment. So now I want you to really identify what does my relationship look like? Well, because many times we say we're believers, but can you see the believer? And not just with your words and I uh, say this, no. Can, can, can a person look at your life and see that you are a believer in Jesus Christ? 
Why? Because during that time, they were always intentional about trying to look saved. But being saved is not a look. It's a lifestyle. They knew the lingo. They knew the scriptures. They knew when to say amen. They knew when to <laughs> fall out. But he says, listen, I, I want to make sure that you look at your relationship. So this month, I'll stand to your feet. This month, I want you to take time to evaluate your relationship. Evaluate. What do I mean by evaluate? Look at it. Check it out. Check it out. Number one, do I communicate? Do I talk to him properly? What does my prayer life look like? It's the, the second month of the year. What, what does my prayer life look like? Can I do better? Can I do better at praying? Okay, yeah, I pray, but I don't, I don't wait to listen. I don't wait for a response. I want to do better at listening after I pray. Guess what? I'm going I'm to be intentional make sure that I'm, I'm, in, I'm not just praying all over the place. So guess what? I'm going to write my prayers down. Because one week you can't be praying for a husband. Next week you want to be single like a dollar bill. God, like which one you want to be? One week you want a car. Next week you thank God for Uber. Make up your mind. One week you want children. Then you babysit the Austin kids and decide, you know what, that's not a good idea. I'm going to go get me a dog. <laughs> Just one. But you want to make sure that you're clear. Not only in your prayer life, guess what? Trust. Your relationship, your, your walk with God is not only about what you believe about God. Amen. It's also what you believe about you. Mm. Yeah. You trust God, but do you trust you? If you don't trust you, you don't even trust yourself. Why would you think he's going to trust you? So guess what you do? I'm going to be better because I want to be trustworthy. I want God to trust me that if God gave me a million dollars right now, he can trust that I'm going to be responsible with it. I want to trust that if God gave me a, a breakthrough right now, a business with doors be open, I want to be able to be trusted that I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do. Yes. Yes. Next thing is respect. God wants us to respect him fear, not scared of him fear. Yeah. Yeah. It's called reverence. Right. Yeah. 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 I do it because I respect God. Yeah. But, but I can't respect God if I don't respect me. Yeah. Yeah. Respect starts with yourself. You got to respect yourself. And let me help somebody out. Stop getting mad at people who don't respect themselves to respect you. Watch. And you getting mad. Big all up out of shape. When they United say hurt people, hurt people. I agree, but I believe that when you've been hurt enough, you don't want to hurt nobody else. And when you hurt, hurt has a sound. When I'm saying things out of my heart to maliciously just, just destroy you, your heart ain't right. You ain't even, you ain't even bringing it from a genuine place trying to resolve. You still trying to be right. You trying to be right, I'm trying to live right. And sometimes they're right in saying I'm wrong. Yeah. It takes a mature person to accept responsibility for their actions. Listen, I, I messed up. I'm not where I need to be, God. I'm not on my A game. I haven't been faithful. I haven't been consistent. I haven't been loyal. But I understand that it's been me. Why? Because if you look up today, and you are further away from God than you were yesterday, I can guarantee you he didn't move. He says, draw nigh unto me, which means yeah. if you're going closer to him, he's trying to get closer to you. Yeah. So at this time, I open up the altar. If you desire a special prayer, I want to pray for you. If you want to help your, you want your relationship with God to get better, I want to pray for you for better. 